So um, for those of you who missed my last debate with Kent, uh, we mainly focus on um, kinds, you know, what defines them, what separates them. And I tried to explain to Kent something that scientists call the law of monophyly. Uh, but for tonight's debate, however, I want to only briefly touch on evolution and some of the points from our previous debate before moving on to discuss uh, the main topic of the fossil record and the age of the Earth. As apart from evolution and genetics, um, which we focused on last time, those are two topics that Kent loves to misrepresent. So uh, without ado, we'll just get into the first point, um, bringing up a point from the last debate um, when I explained how mammals uh, would be considered as a kind under Kent's definition of being able to bring forth after their kind. So um, in response to this, he said that mammals was just a word that we humans use to categorize these animals with and that the animals don't care. Um, but Kent, there's a very specific reason why mammals and eukaryotes and primates, et cetera, are all grouped together. Um, even apart from their shared morphological characteristics, um, it's their DNA. So every single mammal species is more closely genetically related to all the other mammal species than they are to any species outside of the mammal branch. So the DNA is very clearly okay. explaining okay, let's stop. that categorizations are not just arbitrary names that we assign. Um, okay, let's... Let's stop right okay. there. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Kent. You guys can have a little back and forth. Kent, have you an already, Yeah, you already said something that's uh, terribly false. Just because they have similar DNA does not mean they're related. You chose to make them related. They don't think they're related. The cow doesn't think he's related to the bird at all. So, but to say they're related is, is, is incorrect, okay? Man has decided that the DNA code, if they look similar, we think they're related. I'm surrounded by probably 4,000 books in my library here, and they probably all have the same 26 letters of the alphabet. I would bet all of them do. So what does that mean? That's the language which which you write English, okay? So the fact that they have similar DNA code does not mean they are related. In your mind, I know you've been taught they are, but no, it shows no relationship between the elephant and the cow and the bird just because they have similar DNA code. So I, I completely object to that first statement. You are incorrect. You may believe that if you'd like, but that is a religious statement you just made, not scientific. Okay, so uh, apart from the fact that like DNA uh, does demonstrate relationship, I can actually, I I'm fine with just changing the word choice. And I'll just say that every mammal species has more similar DNA to all the other mammal species than they do to any non-mammal species. So I'll just, no, I won't <laughs> use the word related. I'll just say that the DNA sequence is more similar to, and that still explains why these are not just, you know, arbitrarily assigned names. There's actually DNA similarities um, that that make these kinds of categorizations. But um, I don't want to get too bogged down on on something like that. I mean, if, if, if I can, I'll move on to... Um, Another topic that's similar, it's a speaking of DNA, it's from the last debate, and then we'll get to the, the main fossil record kind of arguments. If you're okay I guess that. what we could do, I did see Ken, I, I saw you put your finger up. So if there's something you wanted to respond to, feel free to do so. And then Grayson, we can allow you to move on to the next point. Yeah, he's already stuck in the box that because there are similarities, there's a historical relationship where one descended from the other, et cetera. If there were not similarities between the different animals and similar proteins, et cetera, we could only eat each other. But the fact that the brown cow can eat the ground, uh, green grass and give the white milk and, I, and churn it and get yellow butter and I eat it and get blonde hair, that's proof of a designer. But you're looking at those similarities as proof of relationship and it's no such thing. I'd look at the same evidence, see the same thing and say, wow, that's pretty cool the way that's designed. General Motors makes all kinds of different vehicles and I'd be willing to bet thousands of the parts are interchangeable. I bet the lug nuts on a Chevy uh, pickup truck will fit the, will work on a Chevy car. So what does that prove? In your mind, it proves relationship. In my mind, it proves common designer. So we're already strike one, okay? I don't think that's evidence, but I think you've been taught that for so long, you're probably stuck in that rut. I'll help you out. Yes, there are similarities. Does not mean anything as far as relationship, nothing. 
Go ahead. Okay, so this point actually segues perfectly um, to the next point that I was going to make, um, which was um, that in our last debate, I specifically brought up this notion of um, DNA similarities proving either common design or common ancestry. Um, so just to briefly touch on the, the metaphor with the car parts and the books, um, I, I feel like this breaks down as for reasons I touched in the last debate that cars and books don't have any relationships of any kind. There's no uh, father or mother book or car. There's no relationship at all between these things. The only things that actually ha can have familial relationships are living things with DNA. But the point I wanted to bring up about the common design versus common ancestry um, is that um, and I don't think that Kent addressed this in our previous debate, that's why I wanted to bring it up now, is that the when we use the common design hypothesis to make predictions about DNA similarities, right? Because if, if your explanation for DNA similarities is common design, then we should be able to use common design to make predictions that about DNA similarities. So, but when we do this, um, these predictions fail. So my example for this, um, and in that, evolution does make successful predictions of DNA similarities would be um, Kent is a question for you. So based on your creation model, um, should we expect a goldfish's DNA to be more similar to a shark's or to a human's? And why? Like what, what's your reasoning for why common design would be able to make allow you to make that prediction? I wouldn't make any prediction in that at all. I don't think that's, that's a silly way to even take the argument. All we've ever observed is sharks produce baby sharks, goldfish produce baby goldfish, humans produce baby humans. You talk about ancestry, that's ancestry. We've seen the ancestry of bacteria for thousands of generations, and they never produce anything but a bacteria, never. We've seen the ancestry of dogs for probably thousands of generations, and they always make dogs. So all the scientific evidence from ancestry says dogs produce dogs and nothing else ever. Now, if you wish to imagine, SpongeBob style, that if you went back billions of years, it was something else that's outside of science. I wish you could see that. So I would not make any prediction about the DNA of goldfish or sharks. I don't care. The sharks are different than goldfish in hundreds of ways, you know, but uh, it doesn't matter how similar the DNA is. It, I, I can pick two books off my shelf and probably find whole sentences that are ne nearly identical by totally different authors. It's just the way we speak in English. It's got nothing to do with ancestry. Observable science for ancestry says dogs produce dogs, never an exception, never. So Anything do you, other than do you that, understand my, my logic about saying that if you're gonna use common design as an explanation to explain why certain species have genetic similarities between each other, and if, you're, if your answer for that is common design between them, then logically we should be able to use common design to predict which species should ha have more genetic similarities than other species. Uh, does that yeah, make sense logically to you? I, I understand what you're saying. I disagree completely. I don't think it shows any prediction at all. I think uh, some great inventors of the past have produced some wildly different inventions. You know, Galileo produced some amazing things, you know, and uh, different people have made, make one invention, then they get a wild idea in a totally different area, make another, it's the same guy designing them, but they're vastly different. I think God designed creatures just, just to make us say, wow, you're really smart, God. Uh, but in your mind, you think because there are similarities, therefore, there's a relationship. And that's where there is just no such thing. There are similarities between a dog and a grizzly bear. They both have hair on the outside. They both have a nose on the front. They both have feet. So what? And see, in your mind, you've been taught to believe that's proof years ago they had a common ancestor. I think they have feet because they need to walk and they have a nose on the front because they need to smell and they have hair because they need to stay warm. It's a great design. And there are thousands of differences, but it wouldn't matter. Comparing similarities of the, of the physical features or the habits or the DNA structure is a completely meaningless rabbit trail to go down. All we've observed is dogs produce dogs. That's all. Oh, don't Nothing worry. Else. We're we're going to get to dogs and bears uh, later on. Okay. So just hold on okay. to that idea. Uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not worried my, at all. So my my main point was just that if we look at a goldfish and a shark, we can very clearly see that 
they are more common in design than a goldfish is to a human. But evolution would predict that because humans evolved from the group of fishes that had bones and that sharks branched off from fishes before the evolution of bones, then the evolution prediction would be that fish and humans share a common ancestor uh, later on than goldfish and sharks, and thus human DNA should be more similar to a goldfish than a goldfish is similar to a shark. And when we actually check to see which DNA is more similar to the other one, we find the evolution predicted prediction uh, vindicated. And so that was my point with that. You don't, you don't find it vindicated. You find that because you imagine they have a common ancestor at all, this is one bit of evidence that you think supports that theory. But observation says goldfish only produce goldfish. You know, any exceptions? Has anybody ever seen a goldfish turn to a human? Because you're claiming because we have bones, goldfish and humans are related. That's ridiculous. Goldfish and only make baby goldfish. No exceptions. So that is imagination. You left science about halfway through your description. It's true. We might have more similarities because of the way somebody counted them. I mean, there's how many billions of DNA lines of code? You can count them in all cards. How many lines of code have to go wrong to make your computer stop working? So Any one. Um, you, you see how I can just use your argument against you on that when you say um, like that they're all, no matter how many varieties that uh, like the goldfish can differentiate into, it's always still just a goldfish. But your argument is also that these are just arbitrary names that we give to the animals and that the animals don't really care. So I can point to the fact that every single generation of goldfish is slightly different than their parents. And every generation, those differences continue to add up to where, you know, a goldfish that's separated from another for, by 100 generations is going to be much more different than a goldfish by one generation. And a goldfish a thousand generations apart is going to be even more different. And you can't just say, but they're all still goldfish because that's just in your own arguments those are just arbitrary names that we give them that they don't really care about okay first of all i agree that each generation may have slight differences i disagree that you say these differences add up they do not nobody's ever seen that they've they've created differences in dogs where they decided to select a certain trait like you know small and stupid so you get a pug like my wife's dog or large and you know you can get a variety of dogs but the, they don't the, these accumulation. They don't accumulate like you imagine. They they changes happen, and then they might. There's just as likely to change right back in the next generation. It's not like it made a change and made a change and kept getting improvements. That's, they're not adding up. They're changing within limits. They've been trying to get bigger dogs for a long time. They now have as big as the mastiff. They're three foot eight, I think, is the biggest. Well, why don't they get a dog as big as a giraffe? There are animals as big as a giraffe, you know, like a giraffe. So they've been trying and trying for bigger dogs. Who knows why? But they, they don't add up. You can't just keep adding them up. Somebody taught you that. And you need to get your money back for that part of your education. I disagree. They don't add up. I agree there's changes. The changes have limits. There are well, 400 varieties of cows. We can um, observe, test, and demonstrate that these changes add up. All we would need to do is compare the DNA um, over generations. So we can, you know, we can compare the DNA at generation one and then generation two and then generation 100 and generation 1000. And we can see that the differences between generation one and, and generation two are much smaller than the differences between generation one and 100 or one and 1000. Like we can actually see this empirically and measure it. Um, we just have to look at the DNA. Like ancient DNA for humans also is demonstrable of this. Well, I, I agree that there are variations, but they don't add up. I don't know how you got this. They have tried for years to get varieties of dogs. I'm showing some here. There are now 339 recognized breeds of dogs. Show me the evidence. Science, scientific, science deals with what we can observe, study, and test. Show me the science that would make you think a dog came from anything that was a non-dog millions of years ago. All we have seen is, and you get a new generation, what, every year, sometimes twice a year, Where's the evidence of it ever being a non-dog? There's pictures from thousands of years ago, people having dogs. They're still dogs. Well, a, a wolf is a non-dog. Well, dog, wolf, and coyote can all interbreed. Now, we've decided to put wolf in a different category. We call it a different kind. 
but no, they crossbreed them all the time. Let's well, see. There are some Koi kinds wolf. of wolves that cannot interbreed, like the maned wolf cannot interbreed with dogs, but it can interbreed with other kinds of uh, canines. So, so because so, these, and, and that's enough evidence to make you think a dog and a, and a ladybug have a common ancestor? No, that's enough evidence to make me think that a wolf is a non-dog. But we can move on to the fossil record, as that's kind of the, the main focus uh, tonight. Well, me, Kent, you can add on me, it. And one more point on that. The last thing you said about wolves are non-dogs. Man is deciding all this classification stuff. The wolf doesn't care. Turn all the wolves loose. They go seek for another wolf to mate with, okay? And if they can't find one, they'll take a dog. There are koi wolves. There's a uh, combination of a wolf and a coyote. Uh, uh, Koi dog, a coyote and dog. Uh, what the wolves, dogs, and coyotes can all interbreed. They normally don't, but they can. But they're so obviously a four-year-old will tell you that's the same kind of animal. Put the, put all those dogs next to a banana or a ladybug, and they'll say, oh, those ladybug, and they're different. So you're imagining that these little variations we see can somehow add up to these stupid family trees that they make. And it's just... it. I don't understand. There is no scientific evidence of any dog producing a non-dog or a four-year-old to recognize as the same kind. But again, it's our classification. We're imposing this on them. They don't care. They know what their kind is and they go seek their kind. So I would say that there is scientific evidence that dogs came from wolves, which are non-dogs. And I think that lots of four-year-olds would have difficulty if they were seeing a chihuahua, a pug, and a wolf in comparison, uh, I, would, I would assume that some of them would have difficulty thinking that they're all the same animal. Just like maybe if you brought a chihuahua back to prehistoric man and said, hey, this is the exact same kind of animal as a wolf, I would think that many of them would just not believe you. Well, they may not see that they, they may not if, if, if they would not believe the dog and the wolf have a common ancestor. Why on earth should we believe a dog and a banana have a common ancestor like you believe? Because of their genetic similarities. But oh. I want to uh, <laughs> focus tonight not on genetics, uh, as that was a topic from last debate. And I want to focus okay. on the fossil record. So if you're OK to move on to that uh, portion sure. of the debate. Sure. OK, cool. So. I want you to ask yourself, uh, Kent and the audience, um, you know, what do we see when we dig down into the earth? So the first observation that we make, if, if, if forget about if we didn't know anything about fossils, we didn't know anything about geology, and we're just, you know, getting a shovel and we're just digging down. The very first observation that we would make is that there are horizontal layers of different compositions of, you know, first soil and then rock. Um, and that in the first topmost layers, we're going to find bones of animals that we will well recognize um, from living around the area. But as we start digging deeper and deeper, we will start to notice bones of animals that we don't recognize. Um, certain modern species that we were finding at layers above, uh, we can no longer find the bones of, but they these new animals, um, ones that don't exist uh, currently on Earth, um, actually combine features of the modern animals that we're no longer finding in the same layer. So we, for, as an example, we stop finding bears and dogs, and we start finding fossil animals that share features unique to both bears and dogs. So these mosaic species are predicted by evolution. Okay, I completely disagree. That is not what you find. I think you can probably find bears in any layer. But if you found a bear in a layer, they would change the name of that layer to be the layer that bears lived in. The geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world. It was made up years ago, 1830s. They say the top layer is younger. This textbook says top layer 10,000 years old, bottom layer 2.5 million. My question is real simple. How can the layers be different ages? Where's it coming from? Outer space? Are layers being added to the earth? All these layers are the same age. You take this thing and you flip it over and shuffle, it makes a bunch of different layers in minutes. The layers of the earth are all the same age. There's no such thing as a geologic column. And it's not true that the animals are not found in other layers than they're supposed to be. Trilobites are still alive today. 
They find them in the oldest rock layers. They're still alive. Yeah, they are. I'll show you. Baltic isopod, very similar. So your whole premise is that the layers are different ages. This geologic column did not exist anywhere in the world. If it did, it'd be 100 miles thick. And where are the new layers coming from? Nobody ever answers that. Moving it from here to here doesn't change the age of it. Shuffling a deck of cards doesn't make the top one younger. They're all the same age, all of them. Every speck of dirt on the planet is the same age. If there's any sorting to the animals, there's other answers for why. Hydrologic sorting. Clams are going to end up at the bottom generally. Wait, wait. Hold, hold on, hold on there for because I will get to that. But that was more than just one point brought up, so I okay, want to address sure, some ahead. of that. But I, I will get to the the clams and everything. Trust me, the clams are in here. So um, the first thing you were saying is that there are tri trilobites still existing. I, I don't think that's true. I think that those are isopods and they're morphologically different. Not the same thing. Um, the closest to trilobites you would get are probably um like tadpole shrimp or something but there's again not trilobites so i, I want to be clear on that um and we do not find bears in every single layer right I, once we stop finding bears in the layers below that we start finding mosaic fossils that have characteristics of bears but other characteristics of other carnivoran mammals like dogs so th this is the order that we see um you say this multiple times that the geologic column does not exist and then i've also seen you uh, bring up the point that it does exist in north dakota but you just say that that's just a coincidence but if you know that it does exist in the exact order that we put the geologic column in in north dakota at least and other places i mean there's like 30 other places where it exists in all these layers in the order that it, you can find in your textbook. But I know that you're aware of the North Dakota example. So why do you keep saying that they don't exist? And I'll probably, I'll let you address those points and then I'll get on to where the layers are all coming. Right. From. Years ago, somebody decided to call the layers different names, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, et cetera. And the Jurassic, Triassic, Mississippi, and Devonian, Silurian. I taught her science for 15 years. Those were arbitrarily chosen Many of them are limestone, many of them, but they call it Jurassic limestone versus Cambrian limestone. Why do you tell the difference? By the fossils you find in them. So they're dating the fossils by the layers and they're dating the layers by the fossils. It's complete circular reasoning. So I'll stand my ground. The geologic column does not exist. What they teach in the textbooks, that particular order is found in one place, maybe two or three places. But that's just, I could shuffle thousands of decks of cards and say, eventually I'm going to end up with the ace of hearts on the top. That doesn't prove anything. You might eventually find those 12 index fossils in, some, in the right order that somebody said they should be in. Why aren't, that, why aren't they that way in every place? Why is it such a rare event to find those 12 in the right order that they wanted them to be? It doesn't make any sense. If indeed this geologic column is true, they should be the same everywhere. And they're not. Would you agree there are order, fossils that are out of place? Uh, they call it oop art, out of place artifacts, out of place fossils. What about when they get to the top of Mount Everest and find clams? Are they out of place? Yeah, so there are very, very few examples of these out of place fossils and artifacts. I mean, if we want to bring up a specific one, we can address that. For the clams on top of Mount Everest, this is a result of the fact that the actual material that makes up the top of Mount Everest used to be at the bottom of the ocean. We know that this is how uh, mountains regularly form is when two uh, land masses collide, that it will actually lift up the material that was at the ocean floor. And it will, that is a natural part of the mountain forming process. So this is entirely explainable and expected if the Indian subcontinent collided with the Asian uh, plate. So, that, that's why we have clams on the top of Mount Everest. Um, I think that if you acknowledge the fact that the we can find on places on the earth where all these layers are in the exact order that they're taught in the textbooks, then it's a little bit cheeky to say that it doesn't exist when you can go and see it for yourself. Um, and just to say and just saying that all of these are just mere coincidences. Um, but yeah if you want me to address where the layers are coming from i can do that or if you wanted to um, interject now um sure yeah well we do a demo here when people come take the tour and you're invited again come take the tour uh we shake up a jar that contains gravel sand and 
uh, mud, uh, clay, and water. It always settles into layers, every time. You can get those little sand art things. They always make layers. It, it, that's, that's what they're for, to make cool layers. So the flood would have done the same thing. I agree, mountain building happens to some extent. But to say it's been going for millions of years certainly would not be a scientific statement. You couldn't prove that. It's just as, log more log just as logical to say the top of Mount Everest was the bottom of the ocean covered in clams during the flood. And at the end of the flood, Psalm 104 says the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, and the water rushed off. I think Mount Everest probably came up in a few hours or maybe a few, few months, not millions of years. The mountains are still lifting up and going down. Got, some places are subsiding, like the state of Louisiana subsiding. Some. So, yes, I understand. I taught earth science, subsistence, and mountain building. I understand. But to say this Indian continent crashed into it, that's one theory. That's not a proven scientific fact. There are cracks all over the earth, fault lines, and they're still moving some of them. And we have earthquakes and volcanoes, but it's not scientific that this has been going on for millions of years. We can so, only prove it's been going on for observable history. So if the layers that we observe now were sorted and ordered in terms of their density, I would give you that point. But they're not. You can look at the average density for these layers and you can see that they are not sorted by density. So... If they're not sorted by density, it's obviously not being sorted by water, just like that little model you showed. Well, this contains, I think, three different densities, white, gray, and black. But it will make 40 different layers. It's just the way hydrologic sorting works. So Noah's flood would have sorted the layers into multiple densities. And actually, most, most all of the layers were formed horizontally, not vertically. Watch the video, uh, Experiments in Stratification, by the French guy. Back at the, at the Navy laboratory in Colorado, they have a flume about two feet wide and two feet deep and 80 feet long. They, water runs through this thing constantly, and they pour sediments in. And it'll, more, it'll form eight or ten layers horizontally, not vertically. So as the tide lifting, the moon lifting the tide up and down during Noah's flood, well, if the tide's coming up, guess what? That means the water's coming in sideways to fill the bump. When the tide goes down, the water's going out sideways. So the up and down motion of the tide and an uninterrupted tide on planet Earth would be about a 200-foot tidal change, a harmonic tide. So if the water's going up and down 200 feet, rushing in and out of the bump every six hours, 12 and a half minutes, it's going to make thousands of layers horizontally. That's why we have petrified trees standing up connecting all these layers that you think are different ages. They can't be. Trees don't stand up that long after they die. Your whole premise is based on what you were taught about these layers being different ages. The geologic column does not exist. The, the order that they say it should exist may be found one or two places. Why aren't they in all the places? Uh, so they're not in all the places because of things like erosion, um, unequal rates of sedimentation. Um, there are numerous reasons why we would have unconformities, but the point is, is that the vast majority of them are in this order like if you find a certain like layer then you're always going to find certain layers on top and below it um and just the overall order of what you can expect to find above the layer and below the layer is conserved in the vast majority of all sites on earth um so that's, that's just to address quickly your question <laughs> or did you want to butt in there um well, that, I go? yeah on, on the same on the same topic this is from a public school textbook about the geologic column it contains limestone in four different places. How would you tell the difference between 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? Both of these eras, Cambrian and Jurassic, contain limestone. How, do you, how would you know the difference? What if a bear fossil was found in one? What's the dif what is the difference between the limestone and the limestone? Okay, so you could, one, tell by what kind of fossils what you would find in it, and two, Bingo. you could tell by what kind of igneous layers are located above and below it, because you can use radiometric dating on the igneous layers, but I know I said a trigger word there with radiometric dating. Um, since we talked about radiometric dating in the last debate, I, I didn't uh, include a lot of that information in this one, so I didn't know if you wanted to get into the weeds on that, um, or... If you wanted, I, I just kind of address where these layers are coming from. They're, they're not coming from space. Um, igneous layers come from volcanic activity. Sedimentary layers come from sediments, which are eroded uh, uh, like material from other rock layers. 
Um, and Correct. then you can have no. metamorphic rock layers. None of those are great. Go ahead, Ken. If it's eroding from here to here, making a sedimentary layer, which is what most of the geologic column is, sedimentary layer, it's only moving it from one spot to another. It doesn't change the age of it. It doesn't change the age of the material, but it does change the age of the newly formed layer. Like the, the layer is dated from when it is formed. You're not actually dating the material that the layer is made up of. So if I shuffle these cards, I can tell when this one was laid down. Wow, look at that, the three of spades. That was laid down before the five of diamonds. You're, you're not getting it. Every speck of dirt is the same age. Moving it from here to here or heating it up and cooking it and shooting it out in a volcano, it's still the same material. Right. Kent, you would agree rock. that my atoms are the same age as your atoms, right? And yet we right. are different ages. So that is a more applicable metaphor for the geological layers. Okay. So what you're saying is we can tell when the geologic layer was assembled all the d particles are the same age. So the 100 million year old Jurassic limestone contains 600 million year old particles, but it was laid down 100 million years ago because there is limestone in each of the layers. Yeah. So what's the difference between the 100 million? How do I know if it's 100 million year old limestone or 600 million year old limestone? By the fossils. How do you know the age of the fossils? By the layer it came from. It's complete circular reasoning. It's not just by the fossils. I agree that you can uh, use fossils as a metric, but there are other metrics as well. Like you can look at the layers above and below that limestone and figure out, hey, if the layer above that limestone uh, is an igneous layer and it dates to 320 million years ago, you know that the layer below it is older than 320 million years. Um, so there are methods beyond just the circular reasoning of what fossils it contains um, that we can verify um, some of these other assumptions with. All right. This is, uh, let's see, uh, American Journal of Science. Uh, 40 years ago, they knew this. Intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply. Encyclopedia Britannica, 70 years ago. Cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are arguing in a circle. Succession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains in the rocks. The relative age of the rocks is determined by the organisms. Date the rocks by the fossils, the fossils by the rocks. And we'll get into radiometric dating. Give me one more minute. Fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks. Ah, they don't date them by radiometric dating. I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. And this is, you know, 40 years ago. It's still true. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Geologic column is the Bible to the evolutionist. It does not exist anywhere. There's no simple way to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. Niles Eldridge, famous evolutionist. We date the rocks by the fossils. How can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time? The rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. It's circular reasoning. They can handle this circular reasoning several ways. We can ignore it, we can deny it, or we can admit it, or we just avoid it by pragmatic reasoning. I'm telling you, there is no geologic column. If you found a fossil anywhere in the world, first question they would ask is, where did you find it so we can tell how old it is? Why do you need to know where I found it? Because they date them, the fossils by the layers, then they date the layers by the fossils. If it contains a trilobite, it's going to be assumed to be Cambrian, 600 million years old. If it contains a dinosaur bone, that's Jurassic, 70 million years ago. That's, I know how they do it. It's dumb, real dumb, not true. Yeah, so I'd just like to point out that all of those quotes conveniently ignore radiometric dating, but we don't just have to rely on radiometric dating in order to cross verify um, these uh, like dating methods based on like what fossils you find in the, in the layers. We could also use things like um, like dead zone layers and layers that are formed that have very specific and unique uh, chemical compositions that occur all over the earth. Um, that I don't know how you account for in a flood, like the, like the dead zone layer is a good example. You find uh, like 
rocks that could only form in an anoxic environment, meaning without oxygen, meaning that the, there has to be very stagnant water, right? The, the, you, if you had like global tides and a global flood, you wouldn't find these anoxic conditions. Um, and we find these dead zone layers like uh, all over the earth and we can date them based on their their how close they are to different igneous layers above and below them. That gives us, based on the isotope ratios, a bounded range of years of which that layer could be formed in. Okay. Grayson, this is a really big world we live on, okay? 25,000 miles around the equator. It's a really big world. Are there storms going on in the world right now someplace? Could there be some typhoons or hurricanes going on right now? I think it's that, a aren't safe affecting, that aren't affecting me at all. It's perfectly calm outside. I don't think Noah's flood was constant chaos on every square inch of the earth. There may have been some places for months where it was just, all you'd have to do is submerge the, submerge the land for a couple of weeks and everybody's dead. Noah was in the ark for a year. That does not mean the flood covered the whole world for a year. Parts of it might have been covered for three weeks and that's it. The crust of the earth is obviously cracked up like an eggshell. I think that happened at the beginning of the flood. So the plates of the earth would be shifting up and down during this flood. Some may have been exposed and uh, plants and stuff start growing again. Animals have a place to hide or birds at least or fish. Fish would have plenty of water. Insects would survive. So the fact that Noah's in the ark for a year does not mean it was constant chaos for 365 days. There are storms going on right now, not affecting me in Lenox, Alabama at all. But I think you're, right, you, have right. a, you have the wrong premise there with your flood. Go ahead. But these layers that we observe, like these dead layers or these layers that correspond to mass global extinction events are not just localized. We find them all over the earth. Um, and, and what we find with them is very specific patterns where we can find certain kinds of fossils below these like dead zone layers. And we stop finding them above them because they represent extinction events. Uh, and I don't know how you could possibly explain that with a flood model either. Um, but if you want to respond to that, and then I'll just get into uh, back to my um, script here with uh, we were on okay. mosaic fossils. Sure. You keep saying we find we find. Are you actually finding this stuff? I mean, you or are you trusting what somebody else tells you about it? You say we dig down into the earth. Uh, have you ever dug down into the earth and found layers? We, I live in a gravel pit. We got layers right here and come show them to you. And they're all the same age. So I have dug down to the earth and found layers, but I am not a geologist. So I am relying on the field of geology um, to say what we as a collective human species find whenever we dig. Um, but I agree. I agree the earth has layers. We have seven layers of gravel right here. The layers of gravel that start in Alabama go to North Carolina, 500 miles away. How do you get a layer of gravel 500 miles, seven of them? from here to North Carolina. I think maybe there was a global flood. Tide going up and down, rushing in and out would make layers. I mean, at our latitude, we're turning almost 900 miles an hour at this latitude, 31 degrees north. If the water's going 900 miles an hour for a couple hours, racing into that bump or out of that tidal bump, it's gonna make gravel and roll them around like a rock tumbler and they're all gonna be rounded off. It's interesting, gravel worldwide is rounded. They call it river rock. Guys, it's worldwide, that's not a river. That's the tide going up and down. Noah's flood. But the Bible warned us that people would come who would be willingly ignorant of the flood. The flood explains all the layers, all the... Why are there fossils? Why are there fossils at all? Grayson, how many animals died in the last week in the world and how many turned to stone? Millions, mi billions died. None fossilized that we know of. We don't see fossilization happening at all. And yet there are billions of fossils. Why would you... Why can't you understand that would make one big catastrophe like the flood would probably make all the fossils in one year? Well, I think that the per mineralization process by which uh, minerals replace bone in these fossils takes a little bit longer than a week. Um, but we do find um, instances of modern species being uh, buried in anoxic conditions where they don't degrade and would eventually uh, form fossils. Um, so the point that I was just on um, was um, mosaic fossils, right? I just brought up the idea of uh, dog bear fossils 
um, once we get down to layers below which we find uh, dogs and bears. So in a creation model, which has uh, separate trees of ancestry, um, one could reasonably uh, expect to find some extinct kinds of animals. Um, Kent might say like before the flood or something, there were other kinds that we don't have now. And maybe even extinct kinds that had hybrid mosaic features of existing kinds. Uh, but evolution accurately predicts what these mosaics should look like. Whereas the creation model um, simply accommodates them. Um, and with using the creation model, um, we might expect that the distribution of mosaic kinds of fossils would be either random or maybe based on common design elements. Uh, but what we actually see when we dig up the fossils are mosaic animals that have properties of two or more modern animals in the same evolutionary clade. That is to say, animals that are closely, uh, I, I wrote related genetically, but I'll just say they have similar genes, right? They have similar DNA. Um, for example, dogs and bears have similar uh, DNA to each other. And thus we should expect to find dog bear fossils if evolution is correct. Uh, humans and other four-legged animals have DNA that is more similar to lungfish than any other kinds of fish. Thus, we should expect to find a mosaic fossil between a tetrapod and a lobe-finned fish. Um, how can Kent possibly explain the fact that we have mosaic fossils for species that are genetically close to each other, but not for animals that are distantly, uh, that, that, who are genetically very distant? Um, so this alone proves evolution. No, Th this is a, pr a premise on your part. We find animals today alive that people would consider a mosaic. It's, a, it's got a combination of features from a bunch of things. And what does that mean? All we've observed in human history is extinction. Certain species appear to be extinct. Where are the examples of anybody observing in the observable human history? The last, what, 4,000 years has been recorded. Where's the example of a new animal coming on the scene? I mean, a totally new animal. We don't. We get variations of the same kind. Now, big horses and little horses, but they still horses. Have, has anybody observed any of these new animals? Your, if your family trees that you believe in show an amoeba or a single-celled creature turning to everything, where's the example of an amoeba turning to anything else besides an amoeba today? See, science is what we can observe. We observe bacteria produce bacteria. We don't observe anything else, nothing. Do you believe bacteria turned into whales and humans? Over, over. I'll give you all the time you want. Yeah, so this just gets into what we uh, we were talking about in the last debate with the law of monophyly, where, you know, even when you get a dinosaur changing into a bird, that's not a like new kind. They're both still theropods. Um, so that you're not wait, getting, wait, wait. like, you're gonna get uh, changes, varieties, within the kind and those varieties can get so distantly related that you might think or a five-year-old might think that there were different kinds but the law of monophyly uh, clearly demonstrates that a eukaryote will always you know beget more eukaryotes um, mammals will always beget more mammals uh, etc well now hold it if the law of monophyly is true the single celled bacteria or protozoa or whatever, uh, whatever it started, a single there's 20,000 different single-celled creatures. How did it get arms? Single-celled creatures don't have arms or legs or brains. It does, eukaryote simply means the nucleus is bound in a membrane, that's all that means. So the, it, there's, there's two kinds, there's the you know prokaryote and eukaryote, that's two different classifications of life forms. So what? It doesn't prove any relationship. We never observe bacteria produce a non-bacteria. So how, if it stayed in its law, if it stayed in its clade of, you know, bacteria, how did it turn to a whale? Bacteria don't have digestive tracts like that. They don't have skeletons. They don't have flippers. You, you're, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth here, Grayson. If the law of monophyly is true, then evolution isn't true because everything stays the same. Dogs produce dogs. But you believe dogs came from an amoeba. So the law of monophyly isn't true. Or evolution yes, so isn't true. If a single cell eukaryote uh, evolved multicellularity and evolved arms, it's still a eukaryote. It, it's still the same kind its ancestor was. 
uh, it, in the same manner that if, um, you know, uh, wolves don't have spots like a Dalmatian, but um, a Dalmatian is still the same kind as a wolf. They're both canines. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's the same sort of structure to this. Well, all we have observed is dogs, wolves, and coyotes can be crossbred. They probably are the same kind or came from the same kind, and it looked like a dog. That's not evidence that they came from an amoeba. But so you guys may these wolves fabulous. cannot crossbreed with, with dogs. So they might have diversified to where they can no longer crossbreed, but then, uh, like the Chihuahua and the Great Dane, probably would have a hard time making babies. Be hard on Chihuahua, that's for sure. So uh, the, the variations that happen are limited. This is what you guys don't get. The Bible says 24 times in the first seven chapters, put my screen, oh my, sorry, not the screen back up. Ninth, LDV 390 here. I thought I was showing the slides here. 390. Uh, 339 recognized breeds of dogs. And the Bible says they bring forth after their kind, after their kind, 24 times. Has, have, what is the best example you know of where somebody has observed a creature bring forth something that was not the same kind? Not find it in a fossil and draw a line and imagine it happened. Where do we observe this? There's well, an I awful would point lot of to modus. What now? Chlamydomotus, uh, the single-celled algae that evolved multicellularity in a lab. That's an observation you were asking, um, you know, what's a good example for this? Okay. I, I think most, any four-year-old would be able to see that it's clearly a different kind. Well, is it a colony working together or is no. it actually multicellular? It's truly multicellular. Yeah, it's not just and a colony. Does it, does it, as a single multicellular unit, mate with another unit like that and produce another unit? Or did they go back to That's single cell? That's not the definition of multicellularity. You can have sexual well, or asexual modes of reproduction and still be multicellular. Okay, but when they do produce babies, are they single-celled? Well, they when we produce babies, they're single-celled, right? Well, but okay. then they grow to be multicellular in the same way that Chlamydomonas does. So Chlamydomonas, when it produces babies, does it produce a bunch of individual cells that have to clump together a set for the next generation? Or is it, is it changing no. into something else? Is yeah, it in the same changing? way that we produce single celled gametes, right? As humans, like we reproduce via single cells, the same way Chlamydomotus reproduces by a single cell that then replicates uh, and becomes another version, like another daughter that's similar to the parent that are these multicellular units that are like specialized. They have like not all the cells are reproducing, only the right. specific reproducing cells, like the, the germline are reproducing right. in the same way that they are for us uh, humans. Okay, I, I, I understand completely. Now, what about the third generation? What does that look like? The same thing, yeah. They are obligately multicellular, meaning like every generation um, follows this multicellular body plan. So this multicellular body plan is now working as a single organism, and it now produces another single organism with multicells. Yes. Is that your claim? Yes, exactly. Okay. And that and is it's the obligate, process. Meaning it's, it, 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 right. this is, you know, it's not, even when you take away the, 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 the pressure of the predation, that is what causes change. Oh. Even when you take that away, they continue to reproduce um, in this multicellular pattern. Um, so they obligately. And then what does it eventually become? Because this is this is a rapid uh, this thing is what do they produce in a few days? You get a new generation, right? Yeah. I, mean, I have to look up the time frame on that one. So have they observed this in the laboratory? Grow bones and organs and skin and hair and start to walk? Uh, no, they just brain? observed it evolving multicellularity. So one step of trillions of steps that would have to take place to turn it to a human or a whale. Yeah, but you already acknowledged that uh, that kinds can can diversify enough to where they're no longer even like they're reproductively isolated. So that's speciation yeah. right there. If you acknowledge that and you acknowledge that we can see multicellularity evolve, I mean, that seems, you know, pretty much like a confirmation of evolution. But and that's that's enough to get you to believe these charts right here. 
that a protozoa could turn to a biology teacher. That, that one example you gave is enough to make you believe this and doubt the Bible. It, no, it just confirms that evolution happens. We have to use more facts to confirm that chart, which I, I'm happy yeah. to do. Uh, we were just talking about mosaic fossils. Okay. Could it be that these original single cells were designed to clump together for defense or for uh, stand against temperature changes or something? Maybe there's a reason. Maybe they're designed to do that. And that's uh, so far as they ever go. That one step, a bunch of single cells get together and you want to call it an organism, I would call it more of a colony. I'll do more research on that. But even still, that's one step of trillions that would have to take place. And yeah, so the, the, the counter to that is that if they were designed to do this, then we should see that in nature. And we never have found any Chlamydomotus specimens in nature exhibiting this behavior. It's only when we've uh, experimented on them in the lab and gotten them to make this obligate change. So this is not part of their normal life cycles. Um, to, uh, so right. if you want to say that God just designed them to be able to do this change, I think that that's getting pretty close to theistic evolution. Well, I think uh, people have discovered down through centuries that uh, humans make some dramatic, dramatic uh, changes under extreme pressure. You know, at concentration camps and tortures and things like that, they, you know, they sweat blood, which doesn't normally happen. So the changes that are under extreme pressure that... So they did in the laboratory, were able to get these single cells to clump together, and you're calling it a new organism, uh, and then that's, that's as far as it went. My question is, did they actually make a new organism, or do you have to start over next time with more single cells? Well, I would say that the fact that these changes are uh, being inherited by the next generation means that it's a little bit different than just, you know, like the what your examples were but then i'll also just say that there the the reason it's not a colony right is because when we observe colonies uh, each individual cell of the colony reproduces and that it competes with all the other cells in the colony for resources but in this example the cells are differentiated into somatic uh, cells that emit um like extracellular matrix material and then reproductive cells um, which are the only cells that uh, reproduce. That's not seen in colonies. And their resources are, they're not, each cell is not competing with the other cells for resources. Right. So those things differentiate it from a mere colony. Okay. Um, but exactly. if you want to move on to the, continue oh, wait, a little wait. bit about the mosaic fossils. Um, yeah, no, I want, to do, I want to do some more research on that one, but I just want you to point, I want to point out to you, if this is true that in a laboratory only, this can be forced to happen, that makes you want to believe that it did happen in nature without the laboratory trillions of times to get these single cell creatures to become humans and whales. That is a giant leap of faith, Grayson. You have a religious belief. That's not science. We don't observe this happening. It happened one time in the laboratory under extreme pressure. Therefore, it can't happen in nature with nothing. I, don't, I wish you would just admit you believe this to be true. You believe in evolution. And I wish you guys who do believe that would go start a private school and teach it to anybody else that wants to believe it. But it doesn't belong in a science class to show a chart like this to the kids. Boys and girls, we saw these cells get together in the laboratory. Therefore, you all came from a single cell. That's not science. This isn't observable. Well, it's I believe things based on evidence. And I do think that evidence-based science should be taught in a classroom. Um, I agree. But the evidence... The evidence shows us dogs produce dogs. That's the evidence. The, the evidence shows us there are limits. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but there are limits. Well, the, so the, the limits that you point out are just limits in the laws of physics and anatomy. I don't see any, I don't see how evolution breaks any laws of physics. Well, if it went from a single cell to an elephant, that broke the limit there, didn't it? No. Oh, okay. Well, each single cell of your body, you probably have 100 trillion of them. Each one of those cells has about 100 trillion atoms, all arranged precisely. And each one of those cells is more complicated than the space shuttle. And the DNA code in one of your cells is more complex than the computer system of the world. Mm -hmm. It is dreaming to think this happened by chance. 
Well, and you're I don't say that it happened by chance, obviously. I mean, there are guiding processes such as natural selection. It's not just chance. But I will say that complexity of it in it of itself is not a very good gauge to see if something was designed or not. Typically, when we say that when we know that things are designed, like a pen or whatever example you have, it's because we have evidence of these things being designed. Now, with humans and DNA, we have evidence of not design. For example, um, if, if you have children, right, then that your children's DNA is going to be uh, a totally new code from either you or your partner that their specific DNA code is never going to have existed before. And yet it, it's way more complicated than a space shuttle, like you said. And yet it didn't require anyone to design it. Right. It, it's a it's a result of genetic recombination and natural processes. And, and yet it's so much more complicated than all of these other things. So the reason why we think that things are designed is we have evidence that they're designed. And in the case of genetics and, you know, human reproduction, we actually have evidence that it can occur completely without design. And you can get totally new DNA sequences without any design input from a designer. Well, that's like saying we can dump letters of the alphabet out and make write books. The letters themselves are design. I'll give you that. I'll give you, I'll give you a truckload of just letters of the alphabet. Dump them out, try to get a book, try to get a sentence that makes any sense. It just won't happen. The design in your cell is way more than, than you're giving credit for here. So if you, the, the fact that a sperm and an egg can get together and make a baby, each one of those, the sperm and the egg, are mind-boggling in their complexity. And the fact that they can get together and the code line up and the DNA unwind and, and join back together again is stunning. I don't have a problem just praising God for, wow, that's amazing, God, thank you. I'm glad you made it that way, and I'm glad you made it so fun to do that, to admit it that way. So that's, that's the way he did it. Okay, so in just in the interest of time, I, I think I want to move on back to sure. the fossil record. Um, so uh, we were just talking about mosaic fossils. So with creation, right, we should expect to find mosaic fossils for animals sharing characteristics uh, between two separate kinds that evolution would say are distantly related. Right? We should expect to find those examples if evolution is not true and creation is true. So, for example, uh, you know, we never find any dolphin shark mosaics or dog monkey mosaics or lobster scorpions or kangaroo mammoths or any examples other than the evolutionary predictions. Um, so the evolutionary predictions, for example, like mosaics of dinosaurs and birds or mammals and synapsids, whales and hooved land animals, uh, humans and chimpanzee-like apes. Um, so we, we find all of these fossils in the fossil record, and they're ordered into layers corresponding to the layers of different types of rocks. Um, so kind of just in, in about the order that we were talking about before. Um, sure. Okay. You are, you are claiming tonight, if I heard you right, that there are mosaic fossils showing that dinosaurs and birds uh, are related. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I'm assuming you're thinking of Archaeopteryx or something like that. That's a good example, you sure. Okay. You understand that birds are warm-blooded, reptiles are cold-blooded. There's a vast difference there. And dinosaurs are warm-blooded. Dinosaurs were warm-blooded? Yes. How do you know that? That we have fossil evidence to suggest that they're warm-blooded based on their body plans and, and, and the way that their bodies were shaped um, is not really viable to have a cold-blooded animal with those kinds of body plans. And we also have evidence from like their um, like blood capillary structures um, that we have found in, in the fossil record. So we, we have plenty of evidence that they are warm-blooded. I'd have, I'd have to see that. That'd have to be proven to me. Okay, let's take the hoofed animal and the whale. Sure. Would you agree that whales whales don't have hooves? I would, yes. Okay. So this, what is the transition animal between the whale and, the, say, the cow? Uh, um, well, there wouldn't be a transition between a whale and a cow. Um, the, the, the hooved animal that, it, that evolved into whales was uh, much smaller and, and kind of like it almost kind of resembles like a media, like a larger like shrew or like rodent, but it had hooves. We find um, um, we actually find the fossils of this. I think it's like um, 
Uh, it's the ancestor of Pachycetus. I don't remember the exact scientific name for it now, but we actually, we find whales that then have um, four limbs like Basilosaurus. And so we actually see them losing their hind limbs up to the modern day in the fossil record through these mosaic forms. Now, why is a bone in the dirt able to do this, but no animal today can do this? This is not science. What we observe today is dogs produce dogs, whales produce whales. But you are imagining that a bone you found in the dirt that you think you can put between the two is the ancestor or the change from one to the other. Do it again. Let's take a hoofed animal and turn it to a whale again. Or let's take a reptile or let's take a, a dinosaur or let's take any kind of lizard and turn it into a bird. It just doesn't happen. This is, that's my point, that you're not getting. Science is what we can observe, study, and test. Show me where it happens today. Sure. We do not see the, evidence the for animals today, like terrestrial land animals today, um, evolving for a more aquatic lifestyle. Um, so like we've seen this in like Western Canada, where the wolves have been losing their habitat because of like deforestation and, and, and et cetera. And they've actually been having to spend more of their time swimming um, and hunting for prey in the water. And we've actually noticed since the 70s that they have uh, had anatomical changes um, to have like, you know, more webbed feet and, and, and limb proportions that are better adapted for swimming. So we can see this transitioning happening today. And I'm not saying that in the past there was anything different going on. The, the changes generation to generation are about the same degree as the, genera the generational differences we see today. It's not like there's anything different going on in the past. Uh, I just saw well, that we only have about like five minutes left. Um, and that's kind okay. of crazy to me. That time went by so fast. I didn't even get to a lot of the points that I wanted to talk about. Um, so that's unfortunate. Well, uh, I'm still stuck. You're saying wolves are they're de deforesting Canada, and so they have to swim more, and so they're developing web feet, turning into a duck or something. Is that your point, or what? Uh, well, no, they're just adapting to a more aquatic lifestyle in the same manner that we saw in the early stages of whale evolution as reflected in the fossil record. So there's nothing magical happening about these past animals. It's the same thing that we see today. Over time... Okay microevolutionary changes add up to macroevolutionary changes. It's just a number of generations. That's right. the only difference. I know you believe that. Now, would you agree that humans have a web between their fingers, a little bit of skin there? Some have more than others. Wolves already, <laughs> already have. <coughs> wolves and dogs already have a little web of skin between their toes. They already have that. If indeed only those with a slightly bigger web could survive to swim after their prey or whatever, and they're the only ones alive to breed the next generation. That's natural selection. That's not creating anything. Mm -hmm. They already had the web. It selected the bigger ones to survive. If we had a situation where we lived on an island and all the fruit was, you know, so far off the ground, only tall people could reach it. Eventually, only tall people can make babies. Then pretty soon you got an island full of tall people. You didn't create anything. You selected a slice of the already existing gene code. That's all. That's not evolution. That's natural selection has nothing to do with evolution. It selects. But you're wanting to say that this selection process of bigger webs on the wolf's foot or whatever can create something. And it doesn't. There's no, no creation. I agree with you that natural selection only selects. It doesn't create. What creates is, is, is the mutation process. Um, but they're just, okay, I'll try to summarize. We're not going to be able to get to all my points. I'm just going to try to summarize uh, uh, where, I was talk where I was going with this. Right. So I was going to continue to describe what we see as we go down and we get to more and more um, simple and more basal organisms and we get past clams. That's what I wanted to address. Clams are not the bottom like you claim. Uh, it goes below that where you get to get weird organisms that don't resemble anything that lives today in the Ediacaran period. Um, and they have, you know, strange shapes and body plans, a little bit more complicated than sponges. I mean, they're, they're not nothing like what we see today. And then when you dig deeper than that, you find only stromatolites and other single celled organisms and those fossils. So it goes below clams. And I don't think that there's any rational way to explain the neat ordering that we see in the fossil record. And I know um, that you point to uh, habitat and different body densities 
and uh, different mobility strategies and different levels of intelligence. So the example that I wanted to bring up, because you love bringing up SpongeBob so much, I wanted to bring up his arch nemesis, Plankton. So we actually find Plankton fossils in just about every layer from modern layers to the Cambrian, right? These are not sorted um, according to, you know, like the, the plankton are in all the layers and the actual fossil plankton that we find do change based on more derived characteristics on the top and more basal characteristics on the bottom. And we see the same kind of patterns in the plankton and how they separate out it against all these layers. And the cool thing about plankton is that they have the same body density as other plankton, the same amount of intelligence. They live in the same habitat. They have to live near the surface of the water to get to get uh, sunlight and they have the same mobility. So it wipes away all of these factors that you say could be potentially causing the ordering that we observe. But we still absorb observe that these plankton fossils are neatly ordered according to the different layers and only evolution can explain that. And I don't see how you could explain that possibly in a creation model. Hmm. How many varieties of plankton are there right now? There's a lot. And so you're saying because they're in, there are different kinds of plankton found in different layers. My phone's not working in the metal building, right? I'd answered the question for myself. So therefore, because we see these variations in plankton, uh, could it be that a global flood with the tide going up and down would deposit one colony of plankton at one time? And three weeks later, another colony that happens to be moved into the area for different conditions, water temperature, uh, salinity, whatever. I'll do some research on plankton. I can't get Google to work at all. But uh, that's not evidence that we came from an amoeba and that whales and bananas are related. What we observe is dogs produce dogs. That's all. So you, all, all you shared with us all evening is your belief that if we gave it billions of years, it would change to something else. We're not seeing anything change to anything else. My, I had three kids. They're all human. They had grandkids. They're all human. I'd, I'd be willing to predict the great grandkids will be human too. I'd bet you five bucks on that. Well, three dollars is all I got. But, uh, okay. Okay. So right. as long as uh, we're we're doing predictions, right? And I will say that uh, that the water would not affect the plankton layering like that. And if that were the case, we would expect to see the the layers different based on where we are on Earth, and we would expect to see like you know local variation in, in this the layered sorting of these plankton fossils which we don't see uh, we see them according to you know the evolutionary prediction but speaking of evolutionary prediction this is the last uh, topic that i wanted to discuss before the age of the earth stuff i still hope we can maybe make some time for that but i'll just be very quick i wanted to bring up my favorite example of uh, or one of my favorite examples of a of a prediction made by evolution tiktaalik so I already said that humans are the most and tetrapods are most similar to lobed fin fishes. So we would predict to find a mosaic fossil um, that shows uh, characteristics of both. So for years, scientists had theorized about this transition um, and they knew that based on evolutionary theory that this should have occurred uh, sometime within the Devonian period. And we know what layers are associated with the Devonian period. So the scientists went and did a survey and figured out that those layers are very near the surface in a very far northern island in Canada, right? So they knew where to look. They knew what they wanted to find. So they went there, and in 2004, they found exactly what evolution predicted, a lobed finned fish with wrist bones, lungs, and a neck, okay? How many fishes have necks or wrists? A it was a mosaic fossil that could breathe air and walk on land, but still had fins and other features of fish. Tick to Alec. It doesn't matter whether these specimens had children or not, or what their parents looked like. Scientists used the theory of evolution to predict exactly what type of mosaic fossil we should find, and they predicted exactly where to find it, and the proof was there to confirm evolution. So the fossil exists, and thus, evolution's prediction was validated. Oh, uh, let me unmute Kent. Kent, go ahead with your response. And I think, gentlemen, we'll have to make this the final 
topic for tonight in order for us to get to some audience questions. So I appreciate that, Grayson. Time has flown by. Time has flown by. I agree. Great discussion so far. Love the format. I believe we need to do more debates with this uh, more free-flowing format. So, Kent, whenever you're ready, go ahead with, with your response to Grayson's point there on okay. TikTok. If this was a court of law and he gave that as evidence for evolution, a freshman law student would say, Your Honor, you find fossils that have unusual traits. Or let's call it tiktolic, okay? You don't know that it wasn't part of a whole population that now went extinct. We don't see it happening today. No fish today are growing necks and growing limbs like that. There are Can't some- I'll actually limbs. grant you that. Sorry to cut you off, but I, I, I'm okay with granting you that tiktolic never had any kids and would extinct. It doesn't matter for my argument. The only argument is that it exists and has those features. It doesn't matter if it had kids or not. There are many animals today that exist and have features of different uh, different varieties. There are variations within the same kind or variations. A lot of animals are unique. And uh, where does the octopus fit into here? I'll be doing tomorrow night uh, making babies on octopus. I got... How did that evolve exactly? Where does that intermediate between? We'll get into that another time, but. Let's, so is your point law. then that it was just a coincidence that the scientists found exactly what they predicted to find in exactly the, the layers that they predicted to find it? That was a, It's just a coincidence. Well, first, I don't know that all that's true. You've been taught that it's true. I'll do some checking on that. But I predict if you dig down in the dirt, you'll probably find dead creatures that died, fossils, uh, and they'll be dead. Uh, I predict that nearly all the fossils that are found something similar to it is alive today. They find fossils of all kinds of animals that look just, they find fossil turtles. There's an article came out today. Somebody sent me turtles all the way down. Well, why is there fossil turtles from the very beginning all the way up through all the different layers? Why haven't they changed? We now have varieties of turtles, tortoises and turtles. They're still turtles. So I think you've been brainwashed, uh, Grayson, into believing that what we see is evidence that evolution is true. Nobody's ever seen a tiktolic produce a non-tiktolic. It just hasn't been seen. But they hailed this as powerful rebuttal to religious creationists. Uh, so can, I'm article. okay to let you have the last word on that. If we can maybe just real quick, maybe have a lightning round for the age of the earth stuff. Because I did do some research to debunk some of your points on this. Um, well, what we can do, all... gentlemen. Uh, it, it, okay, yep. Can't go ahead. Yeah, before we do that, that should be a whole separate debate. But understand, the age of the Earth, if the Earth could be proven to not be billions of years old, would you admit your whole argument collapses on evolution because just simply for lack of time? Yes. Okay. So if there's one proof that the Earth is not billions of years old, any one, your argument would collapse. Any one that's irrefutable, if you could refute 10 out of 20, okay, you're still, your argument still collapses. Let's do that another night on the age of the earth. I've been wanting to get a lot more updated slides in my material anyway, so that'd be perfect. Sure. Well, I'll but debunk everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay, gentlemen. Excellent debate. That uh, would probably make for an epic round three endgame debate.